let's begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Barbara Spreckman. I'm the um, Assistant Executive Director at Mercer Council. I also head up the Prevention Coalition of Mercer County. And I head up a um, initiative called Healthy Outlooks for Older Adults as well. And um, we're really excited today to have uh, our speaker here on um, uh, becoming a survivor. Um, Dale Ofe Aisi is, uh, she has over 25 years of, of direct practice experience and expertise in geriatric assessment and dementia care for the diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, um, including the development of psychosocial and educational services for family caregivers. Uh, she was also named a certified dementia practitioner by the National Council of Certified Dementia Practitioners in 2017. She served for 14 years as coordinator of community services for COPSA Institute for Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders at Rutgers University Behavioral Health Care in Edison. And um, she retired a year ago, um, this, this month, right? January, 2020. Exactly, so January um, mm-hmm. She's been doing uh, presentations and um, other things she'll, she'll talk to you about, but uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, just introduce her uh, at this time and have her um, take it away from here. So Dale, you're all set. Well, thank you, Barbara. Good morning, everyone. And uh, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. I want to thank Barbara and the council for allowing me the opportunity to, to do this, uh, this Zoom presentation with you. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to engage in a, you know, in a, in a good conversation uh, about how we all survive the current situation that we're all facing. That's the, I think that's the one most important thing to say is that we're all in this together. Um, I did share this with Barbara, but, but uh, I especially feel home presenting for, for the council because actually I, I uh, retired after 44 years of postmasters uh, social work experience as a medical social worker, geriatric social worker. And uh, if I count my, uh, my field, my second year field placement, it started in an alcohol rehab center. And from that experience, I found my career. And my first job out of graduate school was working in a 28 day alcohol rehabilitation center, which I understand now maybe what we call a white elephant because of insurance coverage, but uh, I started my career that way and be, and work and at a time when uh, many uh, professionals, especially mental health professionals, shied away from the from uh, from working with with people struggling with alcoholism at that time. So again, it. Oh, not only taught me professionally and academically, it taught me personally. So I, I have a special place in my heart. So thank you all. Thank you all. And thanks to the to all the millions and millions of recovering people out there that are, you know, I know taking up the slack that now, especially in this time when a lot of centers are, are closed because of COVID mm -hmm. and people are out there, you know, trying to help and support each other. So again, thank you. Today, I'm going to let me open up, uh, I'm going to open up our, our screen. Hope every, hope everybody can see that. Okay. All right. Well, we all, like I said, we all know, and we've been surviving this almost year of, of COVID and, and knowing that how much life has changed. I know that that old expression, man plans and God laughs. And, uh, and so when you think about what you were doing a, a year ago and what your plans were uh, and how much they've changed, uh, that so much has been 
been not within our control. You know, life as we knew it has changed. For myself, um, as Barbara said, I retired and I had all these great plans. I was going to go to be able to go to Barnes and Noble and veg out for a couple of hours or go and go to antique and collectible stores, things that I never had the time to do. Um, going to the gym, all these great things. And so of course, COVID shot all that and, and the CDC guidelines shot all that the smithereens. And so like yourselves, you know, I've been hibernating in, in home and I'm also a family caregiver. So as well as the challenges of how I keep myself well is caring for my 89 year old mom, you know, who, who is at high risk uh, if should she contract COVID. So like yourselves, you know, it, that all of the, all of the changes, all the life that I had planned has changed for, and, and for what we know is an indefinite period. We know that, that we've lost over 400,000 precious lives. We know that people are struggling, massive employment, and with that, the loss of health insurance. And we know that now that we understand the UK strain of COVID is now here in New Jersey. So, and everything is uncertain, including when we're going to be able to get the vaccine because of the shortages. We know that it's been particularly devastating for specific populations, including older adults, you know, medically compromised people, people of color, disadvantaged people. Um, and there's, there's a number, especially people living in long-term care settings, we know we're devastated, especially at the beginning of, of COVID. And as, as it's gone along, they've been devastated um, by the pandemic. There's a number of reasons why seniors especially are impacted by, by COVID. Most, many seniors are more likely to suffer from pre-existing conditions, you know, be it heart disease, diabetes, cancer, that make them that much more at risk for COVID. Uh, we know that social isolation and loneliness is a, virtually a killer for seniors. And we know that the separation from family and friends, the inability to, to go to the, to the local senior center or to adult daycare, um, to talk with your neighbors, to, to do all the things that, that made life worthwhile have now been closed to seniors, again, for an, for an uncertain period of time and can literally be deadly for them. There, the, many seniors live in home situations that may make them more at risk for COVID, like they're sharing a, a multi-generational home. Um, they use public, they're no longer driving and they use public transportation. And we know, you know, over the past few months, how many bus drivers and people doing public transportation have died from COVID. Many people have, have home care assistance, um, including my mom, who in the beginning of this had a wonderful, wonderful aide who because of, of COVID and because of the, the fact that she was caring for many other seniors, we had to discontinue. So, so, though, so all of that makes it more likely that seniors might be at severe risk. We know that people, again, living alone, um, cannot get the support and care that they need, which makes them more at risk. In addition to those seniors are the people that love them, the family caregivers. I, I call family caregivers the unsung heroes and heroines of our country. They are the backbone. They are the U.S. healthcare system. They're the ones that, that, that really carry on all of the, the medical recommendations that are made, they, prov they, they provide love, care, support, nurturing, friendship, all of those things that, again, help a person maintain a quality of life. There's many rewards in caregiving. Those of you that are out there that, that have been caregivers yourselves, you know that it's a special kind of, of, of love and, a, and a, a blessing and an honor to give back to a parent or a spouse or, or a sibling uh, who's given so much to your life. 
Um, I personally, when I worked as I was program director of a program called Ears for Caregivers at Rutgers. And, and I was especially fond of working with older women who throughout their marriage, they had what was considered very traditional marriages where they may not have ever written a check. They may have never driven. Their husband made the decisions and they took care of the household. But because of, in this case, because of, of Alzheimer's and other dementias, they had to take on uh, responsibilities that they had never done before. And what many discovered is not only do they do, were they able to do them, but they might've done them a little better than their husbands did. So, so you know, you discover strengths that you never had and, and through caregiving, you can personally grow. But also with that, we know that caregiving is one of the most difficult jobs you can ever Oh, one of the most complex jobs, um, marked by what I think we're all going through now with COVID, constant uncertainty and upheaval. Um, there's, there's so many challenges that, that sometimes even offset the rewards, especially if a caregiver is struggling alone, which again, because of COVID is more and more likely. Uh, we know that it affects people socially, financially, spiritually, um, that people that oftentimes uh, there's an old expression, one mother can take care of 10 kids, but 10 kids can't take care of one mother, that we know that oftentimes caregivers are relegated as the sole person, regardless of the, another, uh, the number of siblings that they may have. And so, so there's family conflict that happens. So, Caregiving is already a very difficult, if not rewarding um, job, but it's certainly been exacerbated uh, by the challenges of COVID. Um, now, certainly caregivers, as, as I was sharing with you, I was a medical social worker, so worked with families, with loved ones, with all different types of illnesses, neuromuscular disease, you know, you, just a, a numerous different illnesses. But, in, but what I found over the years is that some of the most difficult caregiving are those caregivers that are loving someone with Alzheimer's disease and other, other dementias with mental illness. And I would also add with substance abuse. Uh, for those, those caring for loved ones with Alzheimer's, we know that there's more than 5 million people here in the United States with Alzheimer's disease. And when I say related disorders, I mean like, like vascular dementia or multi-infarct dementia, uh, Pick's disease, frontal temporal lobe dementia. And we know that you, that those dementias are in that Alzheimer's in particular is a terminal disease. In other words, regardless of what you do, that disease is going to progress. And it affects every area of a person's independent functioning, whether it's their physical, their physical health, their, certainly their mental ability, acuity, and ability to remember, and all the skills that make you the adult, the, the functioning and independent adult you are. And it ends where a person may need 24 hour care. Um, and the life expectancy is, is on the average two to 10 years. But I was a care, family caregiver of my grandmother who waged a 19 year fight, courageous fight with Alzheimer's disease. And she died at 102 in her bed at home with us by her side. Um, and so, so some people break that, that mold, but we know that the caregiving and, and again, personally experienced caregiving for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease provide, it really necessitates a combination of tasks that unless that caregiver is getting the support the physical the rest and the help that they need, they oftentimes uh, uh, experience their own physical and, and emotional decline that sometimes last even beyond the caregiving. Uh, the, especially during this time of COVID, 
uh, there's a special challenges with people with Alzheimer's and dealing and their loved ones and dealing with COVID. You know, the obvious thing is that if you have a memory problem, you don't necessarily remember why you have to wash your hands all the time, why you need to wear a mask, why you why you can't go go to your to your neighbor's home. Um, so that constantly, constantly, maybe there's there's fights and conflicts over trying to keep that person safe. We know that that uh, those support services that provide the the person with with dementia with meaningful activity, as well as the caregiver a break, have have either stopped, closed their services, or very short supply, and they end or or extremely curtailed. Uh, there are there are the hospitalizations in particular are tremendously challenging, where these families are not allowed to be with their loved one, and they are their loved one's touchstone. Uh, they're their voice, and so you can imagine how difficult trying to 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 maneuver someone's hospitalization is during this time, and these already stressed caregivers um, totally overwhelmed. But one of the biggest concerns they have is what if I develop? What if I get sick? What if I develop COVID? What will happen to my loved one? In the same vein, caring for a loved one with mental illness can be especially challenging. Uh, I was on the, uh, the state board for the National Alliance on Mental Illness or NAMI New Jersey for about seven years and worked and specifically uh, worked with caregivers and uh, help design services for caregivers. And those families, many of those caregivers were older adults themselves who became what we call perpetual parents who were caring for an adult child with, with schizophrenia, um, or other mental illnesses who basically never stopped their parenting. And one of their primary concerns was what will happen to my child when something happens, when I die or when I get sick. And, and the reality is because of the, the paucity of services for, for people with mental illness, especially those that, that may be financially challenged, are, are not as strong as they should be, certainly. And um, so these families, again, are fighting on several fronts. Uh, their loved one whose, whose disease itself may make them more combative or, or, or uh, not openly define the family's attempts to, to care for them. Um, the fight with a medical system that, that until recent years has not provided care, physical care for people with mental illness because they couldn't handle the behaviors. It was it's estimated, research estimates that people with mental illness have a, a life expectancy 25 years less as people without mental illness. Um, they in large part because they've been neglected by the healthcare system. Uh, they fight with the psychiatric community. Those people that are that are trained to care for, for mentally ill loved ones sometimes don't communicate well with the families that, that sometimes sometimes hide behind the guise of the HIPAA laws, you know, not to, to provide these families with the support that they need. And the fight with the legal system that that routinely incarcerates people with mental illness. You you know the you heard the stats of how many people that are that are incarcerated actually are suffering mental illness and not getting the care that they need. For them, also the the COVID has been devastating. That usually people that that we know now, and there's more and more focus on the, the human cost of COVID, including the, the impact of, of COVID on mental health, especially people that have dealt with, with a history of anxiety and depression. We know that, that this is, has really exacerbated things. So, so, the, so these families see their loved ones at times getting worse. 
They know that many of their loved ones that, that because of their mental illness may, may have a lifestyle that makes them more at risk. They're, they're homeless, they're substance abusing, they're in jail, they're, they're living alone, they're not keeping up with their, with their physical health and nutrition. So again, makes them more at risk. Um, they have because of because of not only you know their physical care but even with medications with some of the old psychotropic medications that maybe may may create some other health, secondary health problems like hypertension like obesity diabetes make them at higher risk and then the then the loss of support services in the community uh, because of, of the, the, uh, the COVID, uh, which again, for people that need hospitalization has been an especial challenge. We know that, uh, that even though uh, the, the seniors are at very high risk for COVID because of some of the issues that I mentioned, it's also important to recognize that we're talking about a group of Americans who have been survivors in more ways than one. They've witnessed and lived through some of America's most challenging experiences, be it the Depression, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, the Civil Rights Movement, 9-11. They helped save the world from, from Nazi tyranny. They built American industries and educational institutions. They raised and taught a nation of children and grandchildren and taught them how to navigate the world around them. They've experienced success and failure in life. And they've, be, and they've been able to, to understand that both are fleeting and both can change and that you don't have to allow either one to stop you. They've experienced meaningful losses in their lives of people that they love, of things that they love, like, a, like, like their, their career throughout their lives. And they had to move on with life, sometimes more than once. An old, a younger person, something happens and they say, my life is over. An older person looks at the same situation and says, been there, done that two, three, four, five times and I'm still standing. The, one of the things that I loved about geriatric social work is not only the, the opportunity to give back to these heroes and heroines, but also what I learned from them about resilience, about living life, about, about how, you, how you brush yourself off and get back up when life knocks you down. And they served as role models for me, including my own mother, grandmother, and great grandmother. We we had we had some wonderful role models, but unfortunately, in our culture, we don't always value them. And illness, ill, we we see older people sometimes as being non-productive because they're not working, being you know useless to society when they are the teachers that can help us not only dig our way out of this pandemic, but move on because they can teach us resilience. But they need support, just like all of us, regardless of any age, need support during this. But I wanna put that out there because, because I think those very skills that they've learned, those very life skills will help, help you manage COVID, manage any type of adversity in life. And we need to, you know, to again, remind ourselves that we've lived through things before and we've survived. It is true though, that again, the pandemic has really taken a human toll on people's emotional health. Uh, according to the American Psychological Association, more than one third of people, one third of Americans have reported that this pandemic has had a serious impact on their mental well-being. Uh, the people have gone through a myriad of emotions, emotions in response to this, obviously stress, over lost jobs and businesses, over lost health insurance, unpaid bills, family dysfunction, uh, or, or working in a very high stress job like our essential workers, where they don't know how, the, how COVID is going to impact them and many of them have succumbed to COVID. The anxiety and dread 
obviously over the disease itself, but also whether, you know, whether they're going to survive even, even if they survive COVID, what are some of the long-term health effects that may impact their ability to return to the life that they, that they knew? Uh, we, I read a, a story about a few uh, sports figures now who, as a result of COVID, developed heart diseases that now impair their ability to return to their sport. Um, and these are young men. These are young men and women. Um, the, uh, the, we talked about the uncertainty. And when we feel uncertain, we feel out of control. Who wants to feel out of control and helpless in our lives? No one, no one. Um, but that is a, that is a constant um, during this COVID, COVID crisis. Fear, certainly. Uh, frustration and downright anger, and it doesn't help with everything else going on on in our country, in our world, that it just adds to that, that sense of being totally frustrated and angry. And then certainly sadness. Uh, it, it's interesting, as I, as I, I thought about this, um, and, and I thought about caregiving, there's so many common emotions that that caregivers have experienced have traditionally experienced and then how all everyone is is emotionally responding to covid and as i mentioned stress the the very things that i just mentioned um, as you can see in this list um, most of all feeling out of control and powerless and no one wants to feel that it is physically and mentally exhausting The quarantine, we know a, a, uh, another impact of the quarantine that we know is that it has heightened some of our, our social ills that have already impacted millions and millions of people in our communities. Domestic violence, certainly alcohol and drug abuse. Um, domestic violence, they found quite such an uptick in the number of people who have been victimized. You know, these are families, these are wives, husbands, children who have been able to escape their perpetrators, especially if it's a family member, by going to school, by going out to work, by being with friends and family. And now many of them are basically trapped in their homes with people who, again, are extremely physically or emotionally, sexually abusive. And they found the, the, uh, the, the domestic violence shelters, the domestic violence hotlines, are exploding with people that that are that are seeking out help. I'm going to be sharing some resources with you at the end of this, including if you know of someone that that your your suspect is being abused. I'm giving you some phone numbers that um, that may be very helpful to them. Many of the the hotlines now. Um, you have people use a special word like love or, or something that where they know that, that they don't have to, they know that that perpetrator might be right in the next room listening in. So they're able to, to surreptitiously um, outreach for help. Uh, alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, we know that one of the things that feeds that is loneliness and isolation. When you're away from the people, people that are that are trying to recover um, and maintain their sobriety and their cleanness. Now, many of the centers, many of the programs, the 12-step programs, um, are are having to close because of COVID. Many people uh, are are really struggling with with being away from family members who were their primary supports. And so relapses have been have have been heightened also, and the the uh, the hospitalizations and the treatment centers again are in short supply. Most importantly, the thing that that may feed this this mental health crisis that we're that we're all experiencing is this universal and overwhelming feeling of 
grief. And we know that grief is that emotional reaction to loss. There's many shades of grief that, that all of us in some way, shape or form are experiencing. Certainly the grief over what was lost, what could have been and what may never be. You know, that that's whole concept of returning to normal, there may never be a normal. And one of the things that I, I've, I've grown to feel is that maybe in some ways that's a good thing because normal is what got us to this point where we are right now is that COVID has exposed some of the things that we have as a society neglected, be it, be it really devaluing or undervaluing many of our essential workers, those, those young um, grocery store clerks or, or home health aides or people, people that work in nursing homes that don't get paid much, but have really, really come and helped all of us during this time. They've risked their lives to still be out there um, to, to support all of us. Um, so there, and there are many other things that, that, that this COVID has exposed, um, that, and especially, especially healthcare disparities that we need to change. So maybe going back to normal is not what we should be, be what sh not, should not be our goal. Grief over the life we thought we had, the life we had and what we thought we had, um, be it that sense of freedom to come and go as we please, the, the, and the, especially things that we took for granted, including people that we took for granted that are no longer here or that we don't have contact with, um, a job that, that we, that we complained about all the time that now we wish we, we had uh, an opportunity to still engage in. The lost time with family and friends, especially those lost milestones. I mean, you think of the number of kids that got cheated out of their high school graduations, college graduations, weddings, um, even, even, you know, all those celebrating birthday parties, all those, those seminal events, you know, when you're turning 65 and, you know, all those things that we were celebrated and we took for granted that we could celebrate that have now been lost to us even temporarily. But most of all, the loss of those over 400,000 precious lives um, due to COVID and incidental to COVID. And the, the trauma centering around that loss, including the fact that we could not grieve, we could not, could not memorialize them in the way that, that would bring people around us to support us. Um, there was a, 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 a really poignant segment on CNN a few weeks ago where one of the, the regular journalists uh, that report from the field uh, reported on a family who, on, and a number of families in a large city that were reduced to having to have their funerals in a parking lot. And as she talked about it, she started to cry. And as she started to cry, I started to cry. It was so, it was so poignant to hear her and the pain that she vicariously experienced in watching the trauma that those families had to go through. For family caregivers, in addition to the, the type of loss that we all go through, there's a special kind of loss that many family, mem family caregivers experience that was really discovered by a PhD social worker researcher by the name of Pauline Boss, who did, who's done some seminal work on what she called ambiguous loss is grieving that loved one who is there, but not there. Uh, grieving someone who may no longer know you, who may treat you as a stranger or worse yet as an enemy. Um, longing for someone who's been taken away from you because of war, because of kidnapping. 
um, that she talked about that specific kind of loss as that you watch long term as someone you love succumbs to Alzheimer's disease, where again is the what they call that long goodbye. She discovered she she um, postulated that there's two types of ambiguous loss loss. Type one is when a person is psychologically present but physically absent. The, the most clear cut examples of that is the 9-11 where those, those people came, went to work uh, one day and never came back home. Can you excuse me just one moment? I'm gonna go back to the, to the slide, I'm sorry. Sorry about that folks. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the people that are missing, soldiers missing in action, you know, that's, and even some say divorce. Um, type two, the type two type of, of loss, of ambiguous loss, is when a person is physically present, but psychologically absent. These are the people with Alzheimer's and dementia, people that have suffered traumatic brain injury, people that are chronically mentally ill, and people that are dependent on alcohol and, and drugs. Um, there's no certainty. What makes this separates this out from other types of, of grieving, other types of, law, of grieving, is that this is uncertain. There's a lot of uncertainty. We know that when someone dies, people, you know, certainly before COVID, people would, would gather, would call us, would visit us, would send casseroles, would be there at the funeral, would call and say, is there anything you need? Um, I'm thinking about you. That where you had a whole, whole group of people caring and supporting you. With this type of grief, grief, especially type two, people are not getting the type of validation and support oftentimes that they need. In many, in many instances, they're getting criticized for what they do. Uh, my colleague and I in the, in the Ears for Caregivers program used to call some of these families that these caregivers experienced the cousins from Cleveland. These are the ones that a uh, caregiver that was, was up all night, you know, dealing with a lot of stress and caring for somebody with dementia, uh, a brother or sister or other family member would come swooping down from Pittsburgh or wherever on the weekend and telling them what you should have done and could have done and ought to have done. And my, my mother doesn't have Alzheimer's disease. You know, she's acting normal or you're not going to put my mom in a nursing home. And the minute that they ask for support from those family members, they're back on the plane to wherever, saying that, you know, we, we have our own lives to live. So, so this type of grief, there's no certainty that you'll get the support you need. There's no certainty that there's ever a closure. There's no ritual. There's no funeral that, that helps you through that, that constant pain and, and suffering. Um, and that because of that, these families experience chronic senses of depression, chronic sadness, um, may oftentimes as a result be in denial. These are the families that I used to see that take their loved one from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor until some doctor says, this is not Alzheimer's, this is old age, till they say something that they wanna hear. Or they cut that person emotionally out of their lives and treat them like they're already gone even talking over them while they're there in the room with them as if they're not there. There, There's many, what do we do about this? What do we do about dealing with this pandemic, dealing with be, there, there will, because there will be a beyond this pandemic. Um, someone once said, we may not all be in the same boat, but we're in the same storm. And to understand that we're all in this together that we have a, a, a whole village of support if we just look for it. Um, most of all, it's within our own hands how we survive 
COVID. Certainly, and, and I'm talking about more how we survive emotionally through this COVID experience. And, and it's important to know that it's not what happens in our life, but oftentimes how we think about it, how we respond to it. And, and that oftentimes really determines how we survive. You can get two kids from the same family going, going through the same type of situation. One may, may overcome it and, and become someone successful far beyond anybody's wildest dreams. The other may end up incarcerated for the rest of their lives. What's the difference between the two? In many cases, is how they choose to think about what's happening in their lives. Think about it. Are you the kind of glass half full person or glass half empty person when you think about adversity in your life? One of the, one of the things that I learned that again is part of my, my first job experience is how, how important and how valuable many of those 12-step programs was to living, whether you are a recovering person or not. And one of the things they, they talked about is identifying what controls we have. There's so much that's out of our control, whether it's whether that, that, uh, that those new strains of COVID are coming our way, you know, when this is going to stop, when we're going to be able to get a vaccine because of the shortage, all those things may be out of our control. So identifying what control we have is critical. I found that two of the tenants of the 12 step programs can, is a, a valuable, valuable guide. The serenity prayer, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And that, and the tenant take things one day at a time. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Those are, those are things that we can live, live by in our lives, again, whether you're a recovering person or not. Um, and those are the type of things that help us build what we call resilience. The very thing that I mentioned that, that many of seniors out there are having abundance. So what do I mean when I say resilience? It's that ability to turn negative life experiences into positive life experiences. Making, uh, the, the old saying is making lemonade out of lemons. Getting up when life has knocked you down. The ability to adapt to life's changes, regardless of how old you are, regardless of what you're experiencing, regardless of what type of disease you're, you're, that you're experiencing bouncing back from life's hard knocks and finding that you're not only able to survive, but you're able to thrive in spite of it. Um, this is so vital to, you know, I used to, uh, when I did a lot of, of educating seniors in my job at Rutgers, and I would go to many of the senior centers throughout Middlesex County, and, we and I called it my successful aging series. Well, this is one component of aging that is, I think is vital to, to, to having that success, regardless of what age you, you live, you live through, uh, live to. There is a, uh, a researcher uh, by the name of Dr. Gail Wagnil. Over the past 30 years, she has done incredible work on this whole issue of resilience. In fact, she developed a resiliency center in Montana. She is a trained social worker and a nurse. And uh, again, 30 years ago, started working on this issue of resilience and even developed a resilience scale that's being used all over the world. According to, to Dr. Wagnild, there are five components of, of what makes somebody resilient. And I just wanna you know, go through them really quickly. Um, the first one is the balanced perspective on living, knowing that life has its ups and downs and both are fleeting. 
um, that, that you need to learn to cope with success as well as cope with failure and to know that you can learn lessons from both. Um, that's, that's one of the things that, again, helps people bounce back when they know that, you know, been there, done that, you know, this is, this is going to change what, what, what goes up, what goes down has to come up again. The sense of purpose in life, meaningfulness, she, she called it. Um, what was I born to do? What ways am I needed every day and by whom? What in my life has the most meaning, especially as it relates to, to helping other people? Existential aloneness, knowing that, that you have, you, that you're here in, in your, you're here, here for a purpose in your life. You're, that you're here, that you're here to be a blessing to someone, that you're here to, to, to do something special that will make life change for the better for someone else. Um, and, and, my, and sometimes that means that, that you may have to make certain decisions in your life that nobody else is, is agreeing to. You may have to stand, if you know something is right, you may have to stand by yourself. Are you willing to take a course of action that you know to be right, but may be unpopular with other people? Um, that you're, you're, you're willing and comfortable to stick your own path, even though many people may not agree with you. But as you, as you read stories about people that have become very successful in life, one of the things that they, that the, one of the, the, the things in common I found is if I read these biographies is that they kept going even when other people laughed at them, even when other people didn't listen to them. Um, you, they kept, they kept moving. They kept going. They kept, you know, they kept um, going on with life. Um, and and they, and as a result, they may have developed some of the world's most um, important. Um, the, the, some of the everyday everyday items that we use today from the television set to, you know, I think of Thomas Edison, how many times that he, um, how many times that he failed before he was able to, uh, to invent the light bulb and other things. Um, belief in, in yourself, in, um, in your ability to, to uh, be self-reliant, um, the belief in your ability to, you know, to, to survive no matter what. And most of all, your willingness to never give up, your what we call your perseverance. Okay. Okay. I'm hoping that everyone can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, okay. I think everyone is, has that ability. Okay. Very good. All right. Okay. Um, the, we look at people that are resilient and look at some of the benefits of resilience. Uh, researchers have found that these resilient people are healthier. They live longer they end up being more successful. They end up having happier relationships with people. And most of all, they're less prone to being depressed. Life is, you know, we have to learn sometimes that life is not always fair, but sometimes that that's a good thing. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but there's many reasons why sometimes the, the worst things that could happen in life or bad things that could happen in life can be blessings in disguise. Have you ever had that experience where you may have gone through a, you know, a painful divorce or you may have lost a job that you loved or something happened in your life that you thought you would never get over? But because of that, it, it started a snowball of other things happening into, in your life that ended up being even better and, and creating a life for you that was even better than before. Uh, that because of being and being resilient can help us, help us overcome 
the disadvantages that we might have had from childhood. It certainly helps us bounce back if we realize that if I keep going and I don't give up, that, that I'm going to make it on the other side. And it also, like I said, it may also start a snowball where we end up having opportunities, meeting people, going to places, things that we never might have had had we not had those changes, that, that adversity in our lives. Um, I always think that, that we're born to, um, to, to use adversity almost like a, a honing tool, something that, that, that makes us a stronger. Um, that uh, I think there's an old expression that, um, that steel hone, hardened by fire becomes iron, uh, iron tempered by fire becomes steel. Um, and we, and sometimes part of that struggle is making sense, not only kind of wandering through life from challenge to challenge, but really trying to understand how did this happen? What went wrong? Most of all, what can I change? What did I do right or wrong? What can I change so that this doesn't happen again or to make things better? That's the kind of push and pull that really helps us grow, really helps develop those survival skills. Um, that's when I say sometimes that, that adversity, that misfortune can be literally a gift. Um, we can learn to be more resilient by changing, that is changing how we think. And this is the best place to start right now is changing how we, how we handle and how we deal with COVID. Um, keeping in touch with and keeping in touch with yourself, number one, is so important. You know, take a, a temperature of yourself, as I say, every day. You know, how are you feeling physically? How are you feeling emotionally? Don't ignore if you feel like you're starting to feel so down that you can't get out of bed, that you're not eating, that you're not sleeping. Those are things that you don't want to ignore, uh, that, that you want to reach out for support and help. Um, remember also who you are and who you've been before when, when there's been, especially people that have weathered through a lot of crises in their lives. Um, I, I had the, the honor of, of working over the years as a geriatric social worker with many, many survivors of the Holocaust, survivors of, of the civil rights era when things were at their worst, especially in the South, and in just feeling in awe of their ability to survive horrific situations and, and, and be strong and build lives, important and successful lives and wonderful families afterwards. So gather all the strength that you knew you had before. If you did it once, you could do it again. You know, remember the courage that it took and the confidence in yourself. And you had to, to gird yourself up to fight, to fight whatever battle that you did. Remember the survivor in you. Looking at things differently, you know, putting things in different perspective, that, that ability to say, you know, life is, has its ups and downs, you know, what, what, is, what is something that's positive that can come out of this? Um, the whole issue of what we call the social distancing, which has become part of our nomenclature now, um, and now that many mental health professionals are discovering that we named it wrong. Social distancing does not, physical distancing, which we meant by social distancing, does not mean that we have to be socially distant. Physically distant, yes. Socially distant, no. We need to still stay socially connected with people. I applaud all of you right now for being on this Zoom presentation, on this Zoom broadcast, because you're doing one of the things that is critical to survival, you know, during, during this pandemic and beyond. Staying socially connected with people, using that old fashioned phone, writing a letter, emailing, Facebook, 
you know, all those things. My neighbor and I live in an adult community and our neighbor and I shout at each other from across the street and say, how are you doing? You know, how are you doing, Doris? You know, how are things going? How are you feeling? Uh, all those little things that may seem little are vital for, for our well-being. So, so remember, physical distance does not mean social distance. Um, and again, putting those things in perspective, knowing that this pandemic is going to be temporary, is, is long, even though we're coming up on the year, is still going to change at some point in time, God willing. Um, and that what can we do in the meantime? Do we sit and moan and be angry and, and get depressed? Or what do we do to use this valuable time that we've been given to make things a little better, not only for ourselves, but for someone else? You can't do any of what I just mentioned unless you're taking care of yourself. Uh, you can't, there's an old saying, you can't get water from an empty vessel. If you are depleted physically and emotionally, there's no way you can adequately care for someone else, be it as a caregiver, a family member, friend. So self-care is a must. It is not selfish. It is self-preservation. The obvious first thing is keeping yourself, as I say, COVID, as COVID safe as possible. Please, and this is not a, a, a political statement, try to be around when COVID ends. Be here for all of us when, that, when, this, when we can look at this pandemic as a memory. Do the things that, that, that we know now, whether you're vaccinated or not, help people stay alive. Um, so important. Use available telehealth services. I know one of the, 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 the difficulties during, during this pandemic is not having access to your doctors. Uh, over the last, uh, three, the last three years of my, of my career, I worked exclusively with cancer patients. And, and just the thought about them having to miss their radiation or chemotherapy and the impact on their health, not even being able to get a timely diagnosis um, was again, you know, part of the, the, the trauma and the upset that this pandemic caused. But one of the things that has been so helpful to people are telehealth services, both physical health and mental health services. Uh, my mom and I have, have used several, have done several telehealth services with uh, her, one of, a lot of her various uh, specialists, and it has been great. Um, to, to keep in touch with that doctor, to, you know, to, to really keep on top of things health-wise for her and for myself. If you haven't done telehealth, please consider it. Um, if you're able, if you don't have a, if, if you're not able to access for whatever reason by, by computer, many doctors are, you know, talking to you by, by your smartphones, whatever it takes to maintain that, that health contact, um, the, the things that, speaking of the doctors, the very things that they told us to do before this pandemic started is to keep our health, adequate sleep, healthy eating, taking your medicine, all those things that, that, you, that you know verbatim, the doctor feels important. Exercising, they found especially, has been so helpful for people. Just a 10 minute walk around your house or walk around the block may make a difference not only in your physical well-being, but also in your emotional well-being. Stress management, you know, can, is, this is the time if you've kind of stood back and said, oh, those people doing that, that wacky yoga and meditation, all that stuff, don't laugh until you try it. Don't put it down until you try it. There's wonderful, wonderful tutorials on YouTube in how to start yoga, how to start uh, meditation and mindfulness, what it is and how to do it. Um, we, we have a, 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 one of the world's greatest connections we have is prayer. Um, doing that as you're, you're taking a walk around nature, whatever helps you feel better, reading a book, um, looking at a, looking at a, a, a um, 
not so much looking at, at news and TV in, in some of the, the horrors that are going on, but watch a comedy, do something different that, that again, helps you bring the temperature down, helps you, helps your heart rate and your blood pressure go down. Um, using it again, to think through what you want to change in your life, using this time for the betterment of yourself as well as for other people. You know, using things like soothing music, playing with a pet. You know, now they said that that many of the pet shelter, the shelters are, are out of pets now. So many people have decided to get a cat or a dog during this period and, and uh, just playing with that pet that can be so therapeutic for you and and for and for your little puppy or kitten, um, and and taking a, a a nice hot bath or shower, listening to beautiful classical music, whatever it takes to nourish yourself, because what it does not only it helps you physically, it reminds us that in spite of everything horrible that that may be going on in our lives, there is joy. There's still joy in life. Um, I tell people, and I include myself and my and my mother, we sometimes we got to take a break from the TV news. We we have to. Sometimes it just makes you so bathed in negativity. You got to take a break. Um, it's okay to look at an uplifting movie. It's okay to watch a silly comedy. Um, you know what used to do it for me in in whenever I get really frustrated, straight at work, and I take a break, I close my door. And I turn on YouTube, and I hope my 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 former bosses aren't listening to this. I turn on, I close my door, took a ten minute break, turn on YouTube, and find Abbott and Costello's Susquehanna Hat Company routine. That would get me every time. That would start me laughing. That would just for for five ten minutes, and I feel, and I feel good again. For caregivers, uh, my colleague Susan Schwartz and I um, at Rutgers developed um, something we call the three B's of caregiving. It was a simple, easy way to help to help train caregivers on how to take care of yourself so that you could be the effective caregiver that you wanted to be. And it was be educated, be prepared, and be good to yourself. And I'm just going to go through them real quickly. Being educated. There's a saying, knowledge is power. Learning as much as you can, not only about COVID-19, but about your loved one's particular illness. You know, understanding the symptoms, why they're happening, understanding the important questions you need to ask the doctors, knowing the state of the art, art care, what to expect. Using this time is golden because you have time to do the research that you might not have had time to do when you were when you were working outside the home full time. Um, there are some wonderful tutorials that that wonderful organizations like the Alzheimer's Association, like NAMI, have on their websites that offer you a host of information. There's some of the all the wonderful senior centers. Many of them have gone viral. They're doing some great programming for seniors online. Uh, this is a perfect opportunity to, to get involved with that. Um, I'm involved in one of the, the, the New Brunswick Senior Resource Center. We do a monthly um, program, uh, successful aging program. And I just, I look forward to those days, to those, those Wednesdays. Uh, and so that can be one, that can be a wonderful addition to your life at home. Support groups, again, because of the mental health issues that people are facing, it is important to reach out for help. Many of the support groups that, 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 are, that cannot be held are now online. Um, there's a wonderful group on dealing with grief that, that uh, I joined via Facebook. And they're so inspirational. People from the hundreds of thousands of people are reaching out to on that uh, on that grief uh, support line on Facebook. Um, there's other groups that are being held online. You know, think about accessing them to get not only the emotional support, but the education and information you need. Being prepared, so vital, especially during this crisis. Um, I coined something that I call mobilize to maximize. 
mobilize your time, your support people, your energy, uh, your information to maximize my, that, you know, to maximize your time and your energy and your overall health. M mobilize all those support networks around you. Um, again, you can do it virtually. Um, always, always have a plan B, whether you're a caregiver or not, when you're, you're dealing with something that, that you may be, uh, that may temporarily or permanently uh, make you unable to carry out your regular duties. This is particularly important for caregivers. You know, I tell people, have a, make a, make a journal. Part of your plan B is to, you have in your head, especially those caregivers that have been at this a long time, you have in your head all the things about how to care for your loved one, everything from what they like to eat for breakfast to what medicines they take, where the pharmacist is, their whole list of doctors and appointments, all of those things, what they like to wear, you know, bedtime, all those things that that um, that we know go into, you know, go into day-to-day -day caregiving to keep things at an even keel. Have you written them down for somebody? God forbid you get sick. What will happen to that plan if you, for whatever reason, can't tell somebody about them? So write them down. This is the time to do it. Get a journal. You know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You know, uh, something that you can't pull the the um, the leaves. The, the you know, you can't pull the pages out. Rather, um, and just start writing down all these things that you would want somebody else to know in case you can't carry on with caregiving. And then put it in a special place, the same location, um, in your top drawer of your, your in, in your bedroom, whatever, wherever. Then tell someone where it is so that God forbid you get sick, someone can carry on in your place. One of the things that many caregivers, again, just are overwhelmed and ruminate about is, God, what's gonna happen if I get sick? What's gonna happen? Have a plan in action that in case the worst does happen, your loved one's care can carry on and you can rest assured in the, you know, in the knowledge that you've done as much as you can. Being a loved one's caregiver, again, does not mean you have to do it all yourself. That goes without saying, but I just need to say it again. And I say it to myself all the time, that, that you, it's important to share the care, even though physically, it may be a little more difficult now because of COVID. Uh, one of the things I, I really believe is that in a family, nothing's ever 50-50. There always ends up being maybe one person that takes the bulk of the responsibility for caregiving, but everybody can do something. I don't care if you live in California, you can make phone calls to find out what support services are available so you, you can share it with your sibling who's the caregiver to relieve him or her of having to be on that phone all day long while you're, again, you're trying to figure out why where mom is and, and if she's trying to get out the door or whatever. Everybody can do something. And this is the time to open up and say, hey, I need help. The more specific you can be as a caregiver, the more possible it is for you to get your needs met. Um, I used to say to caregivers, when somebody says to you, you know, uh, call me anytime you need me, give me a call, you know, let me know if you need anything. Have a plan ready. When somebody says that to you, say, all right, um, next, next Saturday, I need to go to a special meeting between two and five. Can you stay with mom during that time? The more specific you can be about what you need, the more likely it is that you get your needs met. Maintaining structure. The, one of the things that, that, uh, that really went by the wayside when, when people were stopped working is having some structure in your life, which we realize, and, and I found that as a new, new retiree, those first weeks were, were unnerving because I'd wake up and say, I should be getting up, I should be taking a shower to get ready to go to work. We realize how important that routine is for overall feeling a quality of, of life. Um, yes, is it is it if you're not feeling well, if you need to to be in the bed and lie down, go for it. But every morning, make a commitment to yourself to be up, 
get up, bathe, take, take a shower, bath, whatever, dress every morning and set some goals for that day. Even if it's, I'm going to clean out the closet in my, in my bath, in my bedroom. I'm going to write a, you know, I'm going to make some calls. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do, write, start some small goals because, and then at the end of the day, check them off what you've been able to, to accomplish because that builds on itself. You know, it gets you up and about and, and, and living in life. And, but, but it also helps you move forward and focus goals. Don't let your brain or your enthusiasm for life go idle and dull. Um, they say a brain is like a bad little kid. It gets in trouble when it's idle. This is a time that I hope if you haven't taken advantage of it now, do it now, it's not too late. Learn something new. One of the best things I worked again, it's as um, Barbara shared with you of the, out of the 44 years of my work experience, 25 years of that was working in dementia care. And one of the things that, that we emphasize with people is you have to keep the brain exercise. The brain is like a muscle, just like you have to exercise your arms and legs. You, know, you have to exercise your brain. But, and one of the best ways to exercise is learning something new. And there's a host of things. And I know, especially during the, the beginning of this pandemic, there were so many um, reputable school uh, colleges, universities that were giving courses free online. There's, there's podcasts, there's TED Talks, there's, um, there's YouTube. There's so many ways that you can learn something that you, that you might have been interested in, you didn't think you, you know, you didn't have the time to engage in. This is the time to do it because it, ex it really bathes and exercises your brain as well as makes you, makes you feel good, makes you feel happy that you've accomplished something. Tr the expressive arts in particular is wonderful. I am a, a, a choral singer. I've been singing since age 12 and I sing with the, the New Jersey Chamber Singers and uh, they're a wonderful group. And I miss it so much because uh, fortunately, one of the, the downsides of COVID is that singing is one of the most dangerous things you can do. Uh, because as you sing, as you shout out, you sing out, you know, those those aerosols are coming out of your mouth. And, and uh, it was um, it was not not uh, surprising that some of the first victims of COVID were people in choirs, the way they discovered that in a large choir, you know, three quarters of the choir were developing COVID. So many of our, our choral groups are on hold, but there, but uh, many, you know, really innovative uh, musicians have, have developed virtual choirs and, you know, ways for people to still engage in, in the thing they love the most online. There are online concerts. Um, uh, there are virtual museums. There, there is painting and, and drawing that you can follow online. Online, learning to play. If you've had that keyboard in the corner collecting dust, this is a time to get online and start playing again. It really does stimulate your brain, and it makes you realize that there's life after COVID. So don't waste this time. Use it to to better yourself. Um, most of all, look at our look inside and and look at how you deal with with adversity. Look at how you deal with change in life. Um, do you tend to be one of those negative people that 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 keep yourself depressed and confused? Um, do do you look at things as that glass half full, that glass half empty? Um, that I love that that Chinese yin yang symbol. It looks like two commas upside down, usually black and white, and it means crisis and opportunity. Where where the Asian people believe that any kind of adversity in life also can be an opportunity for change and growth in your life. It can be a chance to start again and and make things even better, build things even better. But it starts right here. It starts in how we choose to look. Saying senior tough, saying 
staying caregiver tough, again, does not mean you have to be tough by yourself. Reaching out is critical, be it the people that we love and care for or that, 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 know, that we know love us. If it's professionals that we know that, that, that we need to reach out for help. There's so many people out here that are willing to extend a helping hand. Just don't go it alone, please. Please don't be ashamed, too ashamed to say, I'm really struggling right now. And there are many signs, as I had mentioned before, you know, you may have a history of depression, but if you know that, if you see those clear signs that your depression is overtaking you, please reach out. There has been an uptick in the number of suicides because of this, this it, it part and parcel of the, the COVID a pandemic especially among the young, especially among, among young between the age of 18 and 25. And there's more and more on TV now, some of the, some of the, some of the, the good things that are happening on TV is that there's more and more focus being, being devoted <clears throat> to caring for one's mental health, as well as giving um, phone numbers for support, um, if you know that you're over under, under eating or sleeping, if you're, if you're refusing to answer your phone, if you're, if you are thinking of, of hurting, or, or you know someone that's thinking or talking about hurting themselves, if they're lashing out uncharacteristically, don't be afraid to get on that phone and ask for help. Lastly, helping other people is one of the best ways to help ourselves and get ourselves out of the doldrums is to look is to look at somebody else and say, what can I do to help you? Seeing yourself, and I, I read this once and I love this, this, this um, phrase, seeing yourself as a valuable resource that should not be wasted. I love that, I love that. Um, we, all of us have, have been born with skills and talents and abilities and heart to, to reach out to someone else. Um, I, I just saw, I saw on Facebook a few weeks ago and I've, I've made sure I passed it to, to and many people are passing this about this young chef who um, lost his job and it, by just a series of, of, of things and thinking about life, turned his garage into a food pantry for people in his neighborhood and beyond that were food insecure. He would he would cook things for them. He he turned lemonade he turned lemon into lemonade a, by reaching out to someone else. What a what a wonderful what a wonderful kind decent man. Um, you got a neighbor that maybe you haven't seen in a while that you know has no family. Have you called him or her? Have you, have you donated to food bank um, or other programs? Have you sewn masks for people for nursing homes? You know, what have you done for during this time to be a blessing to someone else? Um, compassion is our empathy put into action. Can we step into somebody else's shoes just for a few minutes and, and feel what it might be like and, and reach out to them? Um, this is your opportunity. You have the, you may have the, the extra time now. If you're working from home, if you're, if you're retired and you're, you're not able to get to the senior center, see yourself as that valuable resource and help someone else. You get a twofer by that. Not only are you engaged in being a help and a blessing to someone, you get a good feeling inside by doing that. Protecting yourself, especially seniors, protecting yourself from the people who use these, these times and trials to not be a blessing to someone, but to exploit someone. These what we call COVID scam artists. And there are hundreds that have proliferated since this COVID epidemic, everything from promising people new COVID cures to saying, I'm going to help you get your, your COVID stimulus check faster. Just, you know, give me your information and I'll help you out. 
the, the US Department of the Treasury has a website called COVID-19 scams. And I would encourage all of you to take a look at it. It will curl your hair, it will make you angry at the level of, of really exploit, exploited behavior that's, that's abound. As well as, you know, there are many people out here doing wonderful things. And I think we need to pay attention to that and applaud them. But also we need to protect ourselves. Lastly, these are some important resources um, that, that I, I want to share with you to have near you in case you need them. Um, everything from the 211 State Information Nation Area Agency on Aging. Again, many of your local senior centers are still up and up and around, only virtually, and they're there to help you. There's many helplines. Uh, for, for if you're in a mental health crisis or someone you know is in a mental health crisis. The Alzheimer's New Jersey, Alzheimer's Association has wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, workers there that are, that are really poised to help oh, through their helpline to help people, to help you, you know, dealing with a loved one that, you know, that the isolation, the loneliness may be exacerbating their dementia. Um, psychiatric, there's psychiatric screening services in every county, usually, usually in local emergency rooms. Please find, this is the time to find out where your local screening service is. Um, here's, here's the domestic violence helplines that, um, that I talked about before, and as well as the national helpline, um, where someone can actually text and they'll know that that person's in trouble. Um, at Rutgers, we have a wonderful program in the, uh, it is statewide called Care to Caregivers. Uh, it is a toll-free helpline for family caregivers to give you not only emotional support and, and validation, but also important information on how to care for your loved one. Um, Dr. David Kessler, who has that wonderful grief um, group on, on Facebook, uh, has a wonderful website, grief.com, um, that has a lot of great information. He was a protege of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who many of you may know her name. She, she really developed those, um, the, the, how, dealing with grief, the five stages of grief. Um, he was a, a protege of hers and has gone on to do a lot of important work in handling grief. As I said, a lot of organizations have online support groups. Here's some great caregiver websites if you're not familiar with them already to get you started. Started. And even a book that I, I put here, I, I, I particularly like Dr. Arthur Kleinman. I spent a lot of years doing cultural competence training. And uh, Dr. Kleinman was one of the, you know, one of the foremost experts in this area. What I later found out through a book that he wrote and wrote last year is that he's also a family caregiver of his wife. And the book is so, one is really wonderful. Again, I'm not here selling his book, but, you know, again, if you have a chance to read some of his work, um, I, I found that it to be really, really helpful. Again, these, I'm sure Barbara will make these uh, community resources uh, list available to you. Um, lastly, and above all, keep moving forward. Don't look back. We, I know we're all challenged by change. We sometimes beat ourselves up, what I call that coulda, woulda, shoulda syndrome. Understand that whatever's happened to you right now, um, that this is not the end of your story. This is, this is yet but, but one chapter in your life. Use the time that you have to make the best of yourself make the best of things so that when you come out on the other side of this, because COVID will, will dissipate, we will be able to get back to, to, to some semblance of life, but you'll be better for it and you can move on in life um, and, and have the quality of life that, that you would want for yourself as well as the people you love. I hope these tips were helpful to you. Um, and I've certainly enjoyed sharing with you. I'm open to any questions that you have. Um, I want to wish you all the best and tell you, you know, remember that survivor in you. 
Um, and thank you so much. Bless you. Bless you. And thank you again for your time. Thank you, Dale. This was um, really a really um, rich presentation with so much information, so many great resources and such inspiration. I, I have to thank you thank for you. Uh, sharing um, yourself and sharing um, some, some great information thank here. Thank you so much. Um, does, if anyone has uh, any questions, we can uh, open the, you know, your, your, you know, get off your mute um, button. Um, also, I did, there was a question in the chat, Dale. Mm -hmm. uh, would you make these slides um, available for folks? There are some people that deal with caregivers and older adults. They feel that the slides themselves would be helpful oh, sure um what i can do is is i can share with you um how can we do this uh if they'd like to share with with you uh their their email if you if you want to sure. sh share the email the, their emails i can send it to them um or, or through you or through you if there's some way that they can get the slides i uh, certainly would yeah but I, I do have a copy and I can, you know, okay. turn it into a PDF document. That would and, be perfect. Um, okay. You know, and also just for folks to know, we will make this um, recording available on our, on the Mercer Council YouTube channel. Um, but if you email me, you can also, I'll also send it to you. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank that, you. Yes, I wouldn't mind great. it. Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? I know we went a little bit over, but that it was well worth it because we we had a lot of uh, great information here. Um, if not, I want uh, to encourage all of you to uh, follow that great advice because I I think there was some great um, suggestions and ideas uh, for for taking care of ourselves, taking care of others, and. Um, Make sure you go on to mercercouncil.org's uh, uh, website for upcoming events, um, our Facebook page, um, our YouTube channel, and, um, and that's it. So if there's nothing else, I think I'm going to stop the recording.